What's good? Welcome back to Inside the Green Room. Harrison sure. Sanford, Danny Green. You know what time it is. Happy New Year. Welcome to 2023. We didn't have an episode last week, but best believe we are on the mark this week and we'll be riding with you throughout the entirety of the regular season and playoffs for the Memphis Grizzlies. Danny, what's good? Happy, uh, I know I've talked to you already, but happy New Year. Yeah, man. Again. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to the fellas. You know what I'm saying? New Year, new knee. You know what I'm saying? Coming soon. That's me. Did you say New Year, new knee? New year, new knee, not new me, because it's the same, same me. <laughs> not fucking changing. New year, new knee, son. That's, that's what I'm, I like what I'm that. Put that new year with. In the words Put that on a shirt. post? Uh, under Underdog. Put that on a t-shirt. That's okay. pretty good. I like that. Uh, I yeah. want to get to your knee and uh, uh, p- potential uh, trades that are, are involving you due to your previous injury, but we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, I did see an interesting, I, I can't believe it's just been this long since you recorded an episode, uh, mm-hmm. but there's an interesting tweet. You know what I do usually, Danny. I, I, again, I, I don't encourage you to do this, mm-hmm. uh, but it's my job to search the interwebs and yeah. put your name in Twitter and see what happens. Um, and this was a while ago, but not too long ago. There was a There was a question posed by, I think it was Sam Quinn of CBS Sports. It was... Or maybe he responded to it. But somebody basically asked the question, would you rather be James Harden, somebody's bound for the Hall of Fame, uh-huh. or who who people publicly uh, make fun of or criticize, criticize. Yeah. or would you rather be Danny Green? Under the radar, doesn't get too mm. much criticism, <laughs> wins championships. Funny. Actually, um, I know you love your life, Danny, but... Yes. <laughs> would i rather be a hall of famer i think my reasons for not wanting to be that are different than others um i obviously i love how things turn out for me i want to be me wouldn't want to be anybody else but me james has a hell of a career mind you i think we both get fairly treated the same via social media with the criticism and the memes and the and the jokes regardless if you win championship or not that's just how it happens but for me i think the biggest reasons why i like to stay low key is because and we have John Morant coming on later. I want to ask him. I kind of want to ask him about this in person, but they're not able to live normal lives. I like to live a normal life. They can't travel a certain way. They can't uh, interact a certain way with people. Um, so, yeah, I think that part of being low-key is the lifestyle for me. It's comfortable. I can travel commercial. I can. I don't have to spend as much money for security. or I can just blend in with the regular people. Um, but, yes, being a Hall of Famer, of course, is – ultimate goal of uh, that's why i'm gonna say this is why we're doing it but you know playing in the sport being a competitor this is putting yourself among the greats if you be in the hall of fame of basketball um and i don't think it's ever too late you can you can do that i can still if i wanted to if we won a couple more championships you never know if i actually became a coach one day and actually won some championships it's never too late for your boy to, to slide sneak in there so um i'm gonna go with the life of danny green but james harden has a hell of a career man and he's balling this year he's playing very well I'm glad he's he's bouncing back, and you know all the criticism. He took a cut to go back to Philly, and um, you know they're they're playing well. They found their they found their little chemistry a little bit. I've had some in and outs of health in, injuries and certain things going uh, going on with the the team, but I think they're, they're they're finding a good space for them in the East, and then they're, they're playing pretty well. That I think the trade with DeAnthony Melton and the addition to PJ Tucker has worked out for them. I would I would say this: Don't rule yourself out, Danny. Now that you're also a member of the media. What you need uh-huh. to do is get everybody now that you're, you're, you're a part time member of ESPN. What you mm-hmm. need to do is talk to Brian Winhurst, Michael Billpon, Stephen A. Smith. I think these guys probably have uh, maybe I'm not, there's a, probably a couple others who have Hall of Fame votes. What you mm-hmm. need to do is you say, mm-hmm. hey, I, I, I'm just Zach. Let's say Zach Lowe has a Hall of Fame vote. Like, hey, Zach, need. Vote for Robert Horry. He should be in the <laughs> Hall of Fame. For sure. The faster Robert Horry gets in the Hall of Fame, the better, the better chance you, I get. Chance. For sure. Yeah. And then uh, I know this is uh, probably going against the rules of being a Grizzly here, um, but Uh-oh. I'm trying to find my way to sneak onto this USA team in a couple of years. So I have to get buddy-buddy with Steve Kerr, knowing that he's the, ne- he's the head coach. <laughs> so, yes, if uh, anybody... As a fan of Danny Green and know Steve personally, put a plug in his ear that <laughs> Danny Green's trying to be an Olympic gold medalist, which would help you know me yeah. sliding in and maybe on a fifth ballot Hall of Fame type <laughs> situation. 
Yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, yeah. Well, what, what will help you actually is uh, that you also won a national championship at Carolina and, and graduated the most winningest player in North Carolina basketball history, which is quite the feat, quite the feat. Uh, actually, uh, one of your uh, standout moments from North Carolina, I'm going to put John ja Morant onto it later when we have him on the show. Uh, but also want to get to one more thing before we get to uh, 12, um, Mr. Morant. Um, so I listen, as you know, Danny, I also listen to a bunch of basketball podcasts. That is what I do. And okay. uh, this time of year is just it's rinse and repeat. It's time to talk about trades on every single every single popular NBA podcast. And naturally, mm -hmm. your name is very popular on these oh. uh, trade discussions, Always. potential trades. Yes. And uh, I, I find it interesting. I just find it. How would I say this? I want to I, I don't want to ruin it. Uh, I find it interesting to hear your name a lot with the assumption that you're not coming back. Huh. So it's easy. Hey, if you're not playing, it's easy salary to move. I, and I love you to death. But if you weren't mm -hmm. going to play this year, hey, bro, if I can get somebody up in here that could play. For sure. It's, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. But uh, I, I do find it interesting that I think the assumption is that you're not coming back. But optimis I, optimism is reigning supreme. Uh, well, I think there's a reason why. And I may be. Uh, I don't want to give too much insight, uh, yeah. but I, I think there's a reason why that I, Memphis one has kept me on this long. You know, there's a cutoff date where I, my contract. Was oh, yeah. Guaranteed. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, the reason why that they it would be silly for them to rehab me this whole time, see my progress, my progression and see how things are going and then cut me and let somebody else pick me up. And when the rehab is pretty much done, because I'm I'm toward the end, I, the light is near. So I see uh me be on the court soon i think they see that as well and i think it's a big reason why i was like you know the way he's attacking his rehab the way his progression has happened i think he could help us this year and obviously he'll be on the court this year they they, they i think they know that i know that as well it's just the timing of when it's going to happen uh how much time they're going to give or etc but um trades so when you make a name for yourself you're always in the the trade uh, I guess packages or the trade talks or the, the Twitter feed, the social media stuff of trades. My mom don't take offense to it. I said, I think my first time getting a trade when I was in San Antonio, and I was like, oh, this, this is how you know you made it. You know, this is when people want you or it's the, whatever situation it may be, or people are going after you. Uh, but it's, and as you get older, I feel like your name is always in trades. And as uh, obviously with injuries too, people are either looking to dump, trade, move, this and other, see what benefits them. Um, but I think the said so the biggest reason that Memphis has kept me thus far is because they believe that I, and they know that I'll be on the court soon and it, would, it wouldn't be very smart to rehab, put, put that much into me and not at least see what, what comes of it um, in the near future. Uh, now, if, if we get on the court early and things are, when I'm playing and things aren't playing well, going well, then I could see why things may be discussed, but at that point, it will be kind of too early to even see what could be come of our group or me when I'm back on the court. So we'll see, man. And I'm definitely back on the court. So don't think that is not, you know, or that's an option that I'm not going to be playing or that's going to happen that I'm not going to be playing this year. I'm definitely going to be on the court this year. It's just um, a matter of, of when, and we will get a chance to see it for sure. Yep. Looking forward to it. Looking forward to it for sure. And last thing, one more thing before we get to Ja. Um, mm -hmm. I did find it interesting though, uh, because, uh, or, or that uh, the prospects of you potentially being traded, which is obviously still, you know, it, there is a probability of it. Mm -hmm. I do find it interesting. I going back to San Antonio with you um, as you get ready to play San Antonio, as you guys get ready to play San Antonio again on Wednesday, having played them on Monday. I did. There's something admirable. I think from the Spurs organization. For sure. They don't. It seems as if, I mean, I have to go back in the annals and really find it, but it doesn't seem like they're a group or organization that likes trading during the season. No, nah, they, 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 it's, like, it's like they don't do that at all. Especially when I was there, they like to, unless there's like, they don't panic. I feel like a lot of teams hit panic mode or hit the panic button. And it's like, oh, we have to make a move. They're not one of those teams, and unless it's something going on situational behind the scenes of somebody that they're not a fan of as a person or something mm. that's going on and that they don't, you know, approve of. 
most of the time they don't like to make big moves. They keep well the time I was there anyway. They don't like to make big moves. They like to keep a group and figure it out. And it's just admirable of the, the groups and pieces that they've kept, that they've had, and people have come through there and that have been successful. And even when they're not talented, they stay in games. They may be losing some games, but they're 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 still hooping, man. They're playing, they're not on no team you can sleep on. Um, even on their down years, they've been they've been playing well. So um the the hidden gems that they find, the way they stay in games, the way they hoop, the way they the way they uh, I guess I guess the way they function, the how they their organization is and how how much they trust and believe in the picks that they have and give the guys a chance. Um, so it's very admirable, but at the same time, you just never know. You never know in that business. And also I think it's better for the players. You know, when I was traded from there, it's way, it's a lot better to be traded in off season than it is during the season. Lucky for me, knock on wood, I've been able to adapt and adjust in the summertime, find a place to live, get acclimated instead of trade a mid season, pick my life up, go somewhere when I have kids or anything. Some guys have kids and figure out, you know, all right, I'm going from here to the next coast and I have to live in a hotel for the next month or so before I find somewhere to live. Um, that's a pain in the ass. So I think a big part of it is them um, being a little bit more humane. I'm saying not all city or organizations are not humane, but them being seeing the human side of it, of how, you know, they, you know, let's be patient. We're not going to put somebody through that type of situation. But in this business, you still never know. But uh, yes, it is admirable that, that the way they operate. What also is admirable is Ja Morant's willingness to dunk on anybody who's in the paint. Coming up after the break, uh, you will hear from Ja Morant who he wants to dunk on the most in the NBA. But first, a message from our sponsor, Aura. This episode is sponsored by Aura. As a professional athlete with public salary information, protecting my identity, credit cards, social security numbers, password, IP addresses are super important to me. There was a time where I was getting credit card spending notifications for small amounts, about $3 every month. And I assumed it was a one-time charge thing. That's something I set up for a long time ago, but I didn't give it too much thought. Uh, I started to get these alerts more often, about two or three weeks for the same small amounts. I was so busy, I didn't have time to call and be on hold with somebody to dispute these charges. It might sound insignificant, but over a long period of time, it ended up costing me about $4,000. If I had a tool like Aura that could have alerted me about the suspicious activity, I could have saved myself a lot of time and money. And that's not even the worst, Danny. Imagine if somebody was aiming for more. Somebody literally tried to buy a gaming system just the other day with my card information. And listen, I'm making about 1 64th of Danny's salary. Regardless of your status, I don't want to see this happen to anyone. And that's why I, alongside Inside the Green Room, are excited to partner up with Aura. Aura is an easy to use app that includes everything you need to stay safe online. Aura protects you from scammers and hackers by scanning the so-called dark web, where criminals sell stolen information. Looking for your emails, passwords, and social security numbers, it alerts you fast if it finds anything. To help you fight back against those annoying websites that make your personal information public by automatically requesting removal of your info. This helps reduce those annoying robocalls. Or also gives you near real-time alerts on suspicious credit inquiries. Like if someone was opening a loan or a credit card in your name, their VPN allows you to stay anonymous online by keeping your browsing history and personal information safe and encrypted. And they protect your devices from viruses, malware, spyware, and more, so the bad guys can't break in. Aura even helps you manage what your kids can do on their devices. You can restrict specific apps, set screen time limits, and even set focus times to ensure your child is doing their homework instead of binging YouTube. And their password manager lets you store and access your online passwords securely and conveniently. Now, maybe you already have an app that does one of those things, but with Aura, you don't have to download and pay for seven separate apps. Yeah, basically, you just let Aura do all the hard work by keeping you safe online. If you sign up right now, Aura will give you a two-week free trial with my link. You'll be shocked at how much your private information Aura finds exposed over the two weeks. Go to Aura.com slash Danny Green to start your free trial. Also, link below in the description or scan the QR code now. Back like we left our car keys inside sure. the green room with Danny Green, Harrison Sanford, and we are joined by Memphis Grizzlies superstar Ja Morant. You guys just played the San Antonio Spurs last night, Ja, and uh, I believe that Danny did not come to the game with any of his San Antonio huh. Spur championship ring, no pendant, no nothing like that, and I have been told 
that Danny has been forbidden, prohibited from flossing on his teammates with any of his championship gear. Am I right? Am I hearing this right? Not forbidden, man. Not forbidden. But that. go ahead. It ain't that. <laughs> Yeah, no, I ain't forbidden, but I did wear them one time with the pendants, and uh, yeah, everybody thought I was flexing them. We talked about this before. Actually, wifey wore the pendant yesterday, H, so it, they're really wifey's pendants. So I borrow them at times, so she wore them yesterday, so I couldn't, I couldn't wear them. Oh, okay. But uh, All right. <laughs> 12, we appreciate you joining us, man. This is a real pleasure and honor, man. Uh, I know it's an off day, so give the fans an insight on what your off day is like. What are some of your favorite things to do outside of sleep? <laughs> uh normally on off day, man, I just be chilling, man. You know, my fam chilling on the couch. Um, just depends on, you know, what type of day it is. Um, depends on what we're watching. Sometimes, you know, we can watch a movie, sometimes we watch sports. Uh pretty much just, you know, depends. But you know, being, you know, an NBA player with you know the travel and all, um, you know, you gotta, you know, enjoy those days with the fam, man, you know, being on the road so much. Yeah, it's a Kari day. I get it, man. That's what's up. That's what's up. Monday soon for your boy, hopefully. We are uh, working on it, and hopefully we'll have a little junior running around here one day. But go ahead, H. Is there a show uh, that you're running back to the crib to go see? Is there a movie that you just watched that, like, that you would recommend for everybody to, to watch that you recently caught up on? Uh, I just um, finished, well, started, you know, the new episode of BMF today. And uh, now I'm on the uh, okay. show called Kaleidoscope, trying to see, you know. I just started that, too. Yeah, uh, so they say I, you can start in any order. It's, it's kind of strange, but it's, it's pretty. H is, uh, he doesn't watch much TV. The guy's terrible, so he's also looking for suggestions because he's out of the loop I, with I everything. I have an eclectic taste, John. Just an eclectic. I only Bryce watch just, the good stuff. I don't want to. I got time's limited. Yeah, right. Time's <laughs> limited. And sometimes Danny throws out suggestions that just like, you know, you can just have it on the background. No, I need I need something great. I need something great. So there's that. You got to get into it, though. Yeah, for sure. I'll give it a, I'll give it a whirl. I'll give it a whirl. Uh, okay, actually, so uh, did want to talk. So Danny actually got, obviously, a lot of what he learned from the San Antonio Spurs, for sure. Uh, but in general, it all started with his father um, teaching him in his backyard. And obviously, Jai, your, your, your father is uh, prominent there in Memphis and obviously was helping you during your career in the beginning parts. I'm curious, and this is for both of you. What's the one drill that your father's taught you that you could truly see and see it pay off now? John, let you go first. Um, I'm going to say probably starting with fundamentals, you know, form shooting. Um, yeah. Felt like it was something I used to hate, you know, being a kid, you know, you always wanted to just go run around and play. But um, before, you know, every, every little drill or workout, you know, I had to start off with form shooting. Even though I'm a shooter, um, he taught me a lot of how to work off the jab step. And I guess it helped me create space for my shot because I don't dribble much at all. Uh, so so having the fundamentals of using the jab step, how to and I don't use as much either, but he was a real bank. He's a bank shot guy, especially from certain parts of the floor. He's a big Timmy fan. Um, so, yeah, using my jab step and using the bank shot was one of the two of the main things that I could still see very useful. I don't use them much, but in today's game. I feel like um, our lost art and a very and helped me a lot, especially with the jab step. Next time, next time you shoot off the glass, then you gotta point up to for the crowd if for sure. The arena and show oh, well, hopefully up. he's there for game one, man, and hopefully, hopefully that soon. Um, but yeah, if he's there for game one, if I make a bank shot, I'll definitely let him know. Okay. Twelve. Uh, I'm sorry. Did you want? Did you want to? You have another question, there, H? I, I got the follow up to that one. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. All right. All right. All right, Ja. All right, so you got the you got the lessons from your dad on the form shooting. What's the one? I know Danny must have one too. What's the <laughs> one drill you did with your father that you still don't think makes sense now? Oh, <laughs> oh, that's yeah. I'm thinking too. For me, there's not many that we did, and all of them I used at the time. I'll probably never use again now. Uh, but we did a lot of post moves. And, uh, you know, we did a lot of hook shots. We did a lot of, you know, some mic and stuff. But we did a lot of Akeem Olajuwon moves, which I think is that if I ever needed to, if I was ever a star, you know, featured in that sense, I would probably use some of those moves. But they don't they don't help me n anymore today. But those are some of the things that I did. And I was like, it did, they didn't say they didn't make sense. I just said it weren't things that I needed to use as I've gotten older. 
Man, I still don't know, man. <laughs> there wasn't any. There wasn't any drills he put you through that were like, uh, yeah, I don't know if I'll ever yeah, do this. this time I hate it. Like sliding with a medicine ball. <laughs> <laughs> I was little back then, still is now, but you know, I ain't like that one too much. So he was good. Then he knew everything that pertained to the game that would help you and apply to you. There was nothing that was inefficient or unnecessary that you were like, all right. I don't know why I would do because, you know, when we go to school, we use certain, we have certain classes, like, well, I'll never use this in yeah. life. No, There's nothing on the like, court. Well, like for the most part, you know, mainly his drills was all fundamentals. So mm -hmm. whether it's, it's the basics. So I feel like, you know, you always need, you know, those um, in your game. So mm -hmm. um, it really wasn't too much, you know, that he, you know, did, you know, out of the box. But it was some, you know, that I hated for sure, just because I didn't want to yeah. No hurting or anything. So yeah, he told me about some of the times how you, he used to he used to tell your mom on him, and uh, sure. and then she'd be like, <laughs> "Why? Why are you working? Why are you on him so hard?" And he was like, "Man, he's always messing with you still to this day, calling you soft, trash." And I feel like that's a that's a big, uh, not a big, but it helps because he's he's your biggest critic. He's also a biggest motivator, and he keeps you grounded, which is dope. And my dad's still to my to this day my my biggest critic, and and still coaches me. Um, but moving on to the next topic, next subject, college. Um, you weren't highly recruited, but was Murray State your best offer? Um, I had a lot of more offers. Um, mm -hmm. I wouldn't say it was my best. You know, I had a high major, um, obviously, you know, USC, but um, I actually picked up interest and stuff from, you know, other colleges um, while I was on my visit at Murray. Okay. Did you get offered to walk on anywhere? Nah. Okay. No walk on or nothing. Okay, okay. But you had some other offers that were pretty good and it wasn't your best offer. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Do you think about doubling back after you got that high major offer when you did the nah, visit to like your state? It's too late now, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I, I made the right decision on where I want to be. So okay, so okay. So the the scouts, what did they miss? Like when they when when I'm high school, I'm college coach. I'm scouting John Morant in high school, but I'm not giving him an offer. Why? What were they missing? What didn't they see? Who were probably on the other side of the <laughs> other side of the ball, man. Um, whoever I'm playing against at the time. That's pretty much how it was. Um, it was a lot of people, you know, I played against who was getting high major offers, you know, but they still, I guess it was just, you know, laser focused on them. Um, pretty much tunnel vision. So yeah. I I, I was I wasn't recruited till later on in my my high school career. I didn't get Carolina offered till going into my senior year because we had so many guys. We were the last year before you could make the jump to the league from high school. So like, and we had a a really good class, and I was probably was the guy that they were at the lower level until they saw guys like all right, they're not coming to college anymore. So now we can offer a guy like Danny. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so when you're playing against and playing with certain guys like that in AU that are top recruited or high you know high class guys. Um, you know, it's a different type of scope, but uh, I wanted to ask you about that. What was it like playing with Zion in AAU? Like, how was that? Um, it was actually good, man. Um, I can say, you know, one thing, you know, still to this day, you know, with Z, he never, you know, pretty much got the big head. You know, obviously, mm -hmm. he had every college in the world at the time, you know, coming to watch, you know, watch us play. And uh, he was still Zion, still humble. You know, he wasn't bragging or anything, you know, still go out and play hard. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, on the other side, for me, you know, watching all these colleges, you know, come out um, to, you know, watch us and, you know, I'm performing at a, you know, a high level and still, you know, no, nobody, you know, asking about me or anything that I feel like, you know, that probably was the toughest part. Yeah. So so you go through that experience, you have the standout uh, time there at, at Murray State and all of a sudden you get drafted and all of a sudden now, not all of a sudden, because obviously you work for it, but now you're a superstar. But I imagine. I'd have to imagine at some point when you're playing with Zion or you're seeing these college coaches recruit the guy you're playing against, I'm wondering, did you ever even envision being a superstar? I'm sure you envisioned being in the NBA, but did you envision being a superstar? Oh, man, honestly, no. Like, I feel like that was the question, you know, during that time I asked myself a lot, you know, would I even go to the next level, which was college? Um, but to, you know, be able to, you know, receive that offer from Murray, go to Murray and, you know, have a, 
you know, a good career. Well, two years there and, you know, being able to go to the draft. Um, obviously, you know, I was excited, you know, finally, you know, achieved my dream. But um, I know I still had a lot of more work to put in. But um, to, you know, first, you know, couple of years to be a superstar in the league, um, that wasn't on my mind at the time. Well, part of the reason is because of some of the plays that you attempt to do um, that makes you a superstar, some of the things that you've tried and some of the things I, I can't believe you do try in the game. But, um, you know, is there any – and I kind of – I might know this answer. <laughs> is there any one team or person that you're aiming for to make one of those highlight plays on and why? And what does what runs through, through your mind? I have, a, I have a pretty good idea, but is there somebody that you're aiming for that's, that's on the next poster? Bruh. Okay. Okay. What? Why? why oh, because he's just the he's the face. He's the pinnacle. He's he's everybody's. Okay. No, is there a certain team? Is there a team that you you really want to? Yeah. Go to okay. state. Okay. <laughs> okay. But I, all right. So, Danny, you've been in the league for a while. Hold on now, Danny. You've been in the league for a while, and you've mm -hmm. seen a lot of uh, in air confrontations. Yes. Some guys uh, like I don't. Obviously, LeBron is LeBron, but some guys are just not going to jump. For sure. Right? LeBron doesn't like, jump as much anymore. I can see it happening. He's not going to get the opportunity for the poster. And, and everybody says Bron, which I, I get. Um, but to me, I always think people go after the, the, like, the people that they target the most, the person that target that talks the most trash to them. And I, kn I knew it was Golden State, and I figured it might be somebody on Golden State. Because if I had that answer, it would probably be somebody like that or somebody else. But, you know, Bron is a good answer. But I definitely want to go after somebody. I know you guys had a thing with Minnesota last year. Like, you know, somebody on that team or somebody with Gold State, and these are some of your rivals. But, yes, Bron, of course, that is something that you put in the, the man cave and forever can be – you tell your kids because your kids never believe you when you're, when you're 60 years old. Like, oh, you can dunk on nobody. But you got to show them the, show them the proof. So so I get it. I get nah, it. You ever, you ever seen Danny's dunk on Greg Paulus? Probably not. No uh, way. Bro, I don't think he's born It's then. on V8. It's on VHS. You got to – This was – He'll bring it into the locker this, room next time. This was like 2007. Josh, he had to be really young at that point, where he's probably like, what, eight years old maybe? Maybe 10? I don't know. I was eight. Okay. Nothing crazy. <laughs> I'm not getting above the rim all crazy, but that was the the the, the good days when they had the good legs, man. Oh, goodness. Lost those goodness. about five, five years ago at least, so – John, you, know? you got a you got a favorite play in your career so far? Favorite one so far? Oh man, favorite play. I'd probably say the dunk in the playoffs this past year versus Minnesota. Okay. Just you know, you know, on that platform, you know, everybody's watching, you know, playoff game. I, I like the Utah series. I think it was the Utah series that you had. I think was it your was it a year ago? It might have been the year before that. I think you had like forty or something. Yeah. And it, was it Steve O hit you? I think you had a back door and it was like a reverse dunk. That's that was kind of crazy. I'm not gonna lie. I mean, dude, that was like, what the hell? Why would he even try some shit like that? <laughs> um, Danny, but yeah. So Danny, I think Job was talking. Obviously, Job talked about being a superstar uh, and not really expecting it. And obviously, you play mm -hmm. with Braun. You've played with Joel and Bead, Harden, AD, mm -hmm. um, and obviously, this is. What, how, how's your experience been uh, with Job, with him being a superstar at this young age? You've met you've met guys like in their prime as superstars. Yeah. Now. What's the difference here? Um, very few of them I had when they were younger. Uh, so I had Timmy, Tony, Mono. They were older. Bron was older. AD was older. Joel, a little bit older, set more in their ways. I'm not saying he's not. He knows who he is, but he's he's still. I mean, they were hungry too, but he's very young and still very hungry, but a lot more. I'm going to say none of them were coachable, but he's a lot more coachable at this point right now. Um, and he wants to be coached. He you know takes that on. Um, he wants to be better. He wants to make his teammates better. And, um, you know, he, he, he doesn't mind being critiqued and criticized. I'm um, not saying that they didn't, but they were a little older, and I don't know if the coaches did it as much, and they were a little more set in their ways. Uh, but, yeah, he, he's he's a sponge. He's still a sponge. He's still learning. He still enjoys watching film, watching the game, studying the game, and, and wanting to be great. So that's just refreshing to see because um, you don't see that from all superstars. You don't see all superstars be able to communicate with their teammates. You don't see them all be able to take criticism or, you know, he'll ask a teammate what you see out there, you know what I'm saying, be able to be somewhat coached from the sideline. 
Um, so it, it's a great quality. And if he continues to have that, I, I think, that, you know, obviously sky's the limit. And I think he's going to be one of the greats. He's, if he continues going on, he's already one of the greats in his, in his game now. But he'll be, you know, he could be on that mountain rush more if he continues to to go that path and keeps, you know, doing it year after year and builds something in this, in this group we have in this foundation of Memphis where they win a, a title or a couple of them. He'll he'll be one of the, you know, one of the top point guards ever play this game. Well, you you would you would know better than I would. I think you got the next one. <laughs> yeah, um, I guess I don't want to get into that one, but I want to kind of get into uh, some of your tattoos you have. Uh, because I never really got a chance to ask you about them. Um, but there's one that says beneath no one, right? What does that mean to you? Um, it was, you know, something my mom always told me, you know, during that time where I was, you know, pretty much under recruited. Um, mm -hmm. just that, you know, I'm not beneath nobody. Um, and it kind of, you know, hearing that from her and you know, just, you know, believing in that and using that as motivation to, you know, continue to get better. Uh, pretty much, I felt like, you know, got me, you know, to where I am now. Um, just to, you know, keep that hunger and, you know, have that confidence in myself that, you know, I'm a, you know, top player as well. You have a, a lot of tattoos. Do you haven't, did you save space for anything in particular? Um, I still got my back, man. Okay. Um, back and forth on it. Um, <laughs> I don't know, I don't if, know if finish it, but yeah. Oh, yeah, that, that, all of them hurt, man. They're all painful. So I tell people yeah, all the time, like, it's, it's a great idea until you get in the damn chair. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you know, but I got on my arm, my sleeve is mostly, it is my sleeve, it is my championships, my championships on my left arm. Yeah. If we win a title in Memphis, would you ever get one representing For that, sure. that title? A Memphis Grizzlies tattoo. Okay. Okay. I mean, I say space, so. <laughs> we'll be getting some some of these probably something a little different but you know some some similar in a sense because i got space if we want another if i want another one i'm gonna definitely have to get a memphis tattoo man with it with that trophy because that's that's the storyline right there sure yeah yeah no I, danny's tattoos are pretty cool uh commemorating those moments uh beneath no one is a pretty uh a, a nice a nice quote a nice like mantra to have and i just wanted to go over some of the quotes that you've also had as well and the first one I thought was you, but apparently it wasn't because we had Jaron Jackson on and I asked him because I, I I look back at the quote, uh, we want all the smoke, we'll, we'll climb up the chimney. I'm, I'm paraphrasing what you said. And I said, I said, Jaron, who's ghostwriting Jaws quotes? He's got bars. <laughs> <laughs> then he was like, nah, that's all NBA young boy. I was like, oh, what? I didn't nah, know. This. I, I, I thought I thought you had all the bars yourself, my friend. No, nah, not that, that one. That, that one came from my pops, man. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. He used to play that when we were younger. Um, we used to play AAU and stuff. So anytime, you know, it was time to play a you know a big time team, you know, that's was his message basically to us every time. We speaking of speaking of uh bars, do you ever be getting the studios? I know you're big into music. You ever nah. get in the studio? Nah. Nah, man. <laughs> okay. okay. I know BC being there. I know Jaron being there sometimes. Junior, that's Kenny Lofton Jr. They get in the studio sometimes. But I, I know you're big into music. You always know the songs, the newest ones that are out. You're all young, like a lot of the guys' music. music um, fan, not that much, man. I probably okay. joke about it, but no, nah, I never, you know. Anybody okay. you would want to get into the booth with? Me? You want to be a, maybe be a producer? Man. See, now I gotta I gotta go big dog. I gotta be in there with Jay-Z, man. Okay, okay. Mm. It's not a bad choice. Not I'm bad actually choice. surprised by the answer, actually. I'm actually I'm <laughs> shocked he didn't go with the younger generation guys. But yeah, Jay hey, he's hey, unique. Hey, hey John, let's say, let's say you got my salary, right? Not your salary, my <laughs> salary. Right? I don't make the big bucks. <laughs> Jay, you get offered. This is the this is the social media question. You get offered a hundred thousand dollars or dinner with Jay-Z. What are you doing? Hundred thousand a dinner with Jay Z on. You're my salary now, not your salary. Oof, that's a good one. <laughs> that's a good one. I feel like you know at that point, obviously I'm a you know a fan of Jay Z, so I'm gonna be asking about music, but I'm asking you know how he you know getting his other bread that yeah. we don't know about. You so. know, but 
You're leaving with no money, though. He's not cutting no, no that's check. That's a tough one. That's a tough one. But I feel like you're living fine, my dog. We on here right now. You living good. Yeah. <laughs> He's doing all right. He, you all right. So you can, you, you cover right. a couple bills, son. You good. You ain't missing no bills. You ain't missing no meals. You be all right. You good. I might take that dinner yeah. with home, man. Yeah. There was uh, another quote uh, you wanted to ask about, H. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and obviously, quote. it's been a topic for some time, of course. Yes, for sure. Um. The quote that you made uh, to Malika Andrews from ESPN, obviously it caught it caught attention, uh, saying you're fine in the West. Uh, but uh, Draymond responded. He said, you are fine in the West, Ja, but the Warriors are in the West now, champ. These are his words uh, verbatim. So, yes, you are fine, Ja. The Grizzlies, on the other hand, that's a topic for another day. Full quote. Your thoughts? Like I said, man, if I needed to say it like this, the Grizzlies are fine in the West, and there you go. That's the Double stamp. There you go. Yeah, that's the anybody comp you have in your team. Yeah. Anybody mm. pull you? Anybody pull you aside after you made that that quote, or if that after that quote made the rounds? Nah, man. Yeah, yeah nah. Coach is fully behind them. Front office is fully behind them. Our teams for sure behind them because everybody believes that, and that's one of the things that uh, I enjoy in the atmosphere, or I, I like those different from the atmospheres I've been in, is. You know, confidence can make or break you in this league. So, but when the, the way these guys come in, their attitude, their mindset, uh, you know, they're, they're competitors to the fullest. You know, I've seen Dez the other night. He got into a Jordan Clarkson. And it's not like he's trying to be a thug or a gangster or trying to beat somebody up, but he just loves compete where he's going to talk trash to you and get in your face. You know what I'm saying? He ain't anybody trying to threaten to beat nobody up. They just want to want to hoop and they want to get the best of you. So that's just everybody down the line from the guys you think that are quiet from the guys that, you know, yeah, maybe in your sure. face, but everybody's just, just how they are, man. And, and they're like, Oh, this is what we about this is what we doing. So, and I, and I love it. And it's said all of the, the coaching staff and front office are fully behind it. And then they love it too. So it's, it's Memphis basketball and that's what's known to be. And we said, so we ain't backing down from nobody. So I, that's, that's, that's how we go on, you know, from here on out, I have to play. So uh wait, hold on now. Was 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 Dylan? I mean, sorry, was Desmond telling him what he was while he was giving him the business? Was he was he you know what I'm saying? Was he saying I'm, you saw the whole Larry him? I'm gonna do a step back, hit the three, and then it was like what was he what was going on? I mean, they on? have been they have been talking a little bit. You can see throughout the game just a little bit here and there. And before the play before that, you know, Des just hit hit a, a shot, it was a big shot too. And he's finally found his rhythm back. And you know, he was he was in a good flow and they were going back and forth a little bit. I guess, you know, Jordan Clarkson took it a little farther than he should have, of course. But when it happened, you know, anybody backing down, everybody tried to protect Dez, but Dez ain't backing down either. But we just hoop. That's how he hoops. You know, he ain't going to be any, any different, no matter who it is. And you've seen Dez get into a brawn before. You know, he it don't matter. He ain't backing. Oh, yeah. He ain't scared of nobody. So that's just who he is. That's who that's who the, you know, the Grizzlies are. They ain't. They come in and they come in for you, you know, at, at all, every angle possible, you know. So uh, pause. But, yeah. <laughs> Biggest <laughs> us into the next topic. Uh, <laughs> biggest learning lesson from the playoffs last year, 12, which, which you uh, you guys went through a couple of different ups and downs, obviously health wise and teams wise. Uh, we had some battles. What was the biggest lesson you learned from the, the playoffs last year? Um, pretty much attention to detail, you know, just locking in on, you know, the game plan. Um, I felt like um, even in that, you know, Minnesota series, um, we had some, you know, breakdowns um, a lot, which had us, you know, down pretty much that entire series, um, having us to, you know, have to fight back in order to, you know, make it out of that first round. And, you know, then going to Golden State, you know, a team where, you know, you can't have too many mistakes. Um, I feel like, you know, we had some that hurt us and then, you know, they made us pay for it. And um, I feel like, you know, that's the biggest, you know, lesson, you know, I've learned. And, you know, now, you know, going into this season, obviously it's um, something, you know, we preach about a lot now. So. For sure. And watching from the sideline, a lot of the things that you do, you make it look very easy. And even I'm on the sideline now, so it's easy for me to talk and coach and t tell it like like I could do. And when I go out there and watch myself, I'm like, damn, it's not that easy. And, it, and I look terrible doing it most of the time. What are some of the things that that are actually a, a lot more difficult than people think when it comes to the details, the basketball, the playoffs and night in, night out playing through a regular season? Um. I can feel like, like, basically, man, I just learned it. Like, you know, it's different uh, from, you know, regular season games and playoff games. 
it's like now, you know, you pretty much can turn your focus, you know, during the playoffs to this one team. Like you can focus on this one team, um, you know, for a seven game series. So uh, for me, you know, I felt like team was able to, you know, scout me better, uh, especially, you know, in that Minnesota series. Obviously, um, they pretty much kept, you know, a lot of bodies in front of me. You know, ball screens, they pretty much was, you know, trying to blitz it to get the ball out my hands. And um, that's why, you know, I wasn't scoring as much points, but, you know, my assists was, you know, high, you know, during that series. Um, I feel like anybody, you know, who's on the outside of it can say anything like, oh, I would have did this during this situation. But mm-hmm. actually you know, being in that game, um, it's a lot different, man. Yeah. Especially when it's coming. It's happened fast. So, like, yeah, people are like right, I know traps coming. You like, all right, this is what I'm going to do. But when it happens, you got to yeah. think quick. You got to make quick decisions. Do I throw a corner? Or I throw a middle. And a lot of times you make the decision beforehand or you try to premeditate the decision. And maybe a turnover it might happen to be a successful play, but you never know. You got to think yeah. quick. So people don't understand how fast your mind has to work in the game of knowing the personnel you're closing out to. And like you said, the biggest thing is after your rookie year, everybody knows the scout report on you. So what adjustments yeah. are you going to make to be better? To People know you can shoot now. They're going to try to run you off the line. How are you going to still shoot effectively? No, them knowing that. How, what counter moves are you going to make? People know you can jump now. People are going to know you can do this off the pick and roll. Can you make an adjustment when they they change the coverage up on you? So that's the biggest, that's the toughest adjustment is year and year, year after year, continuing not to just do the things you did, but doing better, but doing to where even though people are scouting you, trying to stop it, still doing it and, and making it kind of unstoppable. So yeah, that that's definitely, that's a tough part of being in this league when people know what your, your strengths and weaknesses are. Yeah. Uh, what else is difficult? I'm going to run off some stats here. It blows my mind. What else is difficult is uh, the defense that uh, your teammates are playing their job, Jaron and Dylan. Uh, I got some wild stats as it pertains to Jaron. Ready? Opponents are shooting 12.5% worse at the rim when Jaron Jackson is on the floor. Shooting 49.8% in the restricted area, which is 5% better than any other big in the league. Opponents are shooting 40% when he is five feet within them. Pause. And then the last (laughs) one, when he is contesting a shot at the rim, opponents have 56 made field goals. He has 69 block shots on this season. 56 made field goals in his area, 69 block shots. First off, what does it mean to be playing with somebody like that on the back end and then I have a follow up to that. Um, you know, Jared, man, he's special. Um, you know, he's, you know, I feel like one of the, you know, best, you know, defenders in this league. Um, when he's when he's locked, um, mm-hmm. you know, it's times where you know he can get in foul trouble, um, and that pretty much you know take him out. But you know, when he's locked, he's per- protecting the rim at a very high level. Um, and also, you know, being able to you know red out on you know guards and you know contain you know certain guards. Um, just his versatility on that, you know, that end of the floor. Um, I, I feel like, you know, help us a lot, you know, on, on the defensive side. And, you know, it makes us, you know, a good team defensively. So for those yeah. that don't know, that means that means switch out. He said red out. He means switch out to to guards. A lot of people don't understand some of the terminology. <laughs> but yeah, Jaron is very special. So is DB. You got shout out, you know, evil twin. Yeah, Dylan's been playing a hell of a Hell of a season on defense and on the floor. Go ahead, Harrison. You know something else you wanted to no, no, statue no, giving us? No, no, you 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 did it perfectly for me. So yeah, and Dylan is is kind of built the same way, I guess. Evil Danny Green. Do y'all? I, do you do, do you call him that? Uh, job? You don't no. call him Evil Danny Green. It's his name, nah. right? <laughs> I don't even know when it first started. I don't know. It started some years ago. Job ja probably probably his rookie year or something like that. Yeah, but um, but he's he's been hooping. He's been balling both of them. Jaron and Jaron missed the first month of the season. So for him to Average three blocks a game and a steal. Dylan holding down the defense. And for me, this is, I'm a defensive player, so I'm excited to play alongside those guys when I get a chance to and hopefully make us better in that aspect, but also bring some shooting on the perimeter. But, you know, th- those are the things that make me excited about this team that, you know, makes me think that they could be a championship team. That's that's where it starts. It starts out on the floor mm-hmm. when you got a guy like and Jaren's locked in every night and doesn't get in foul trouble. Dylan, same thing locked in and, and don't let his emotions get to him where he gets technicals, takes himself out of the game. Um, it'll make us a very dangerous team because there are nights where we're going to have to find wins when we don't have shooting, when we're not scoring. And, and that's how we do it with those two guys. And those guys have been balling. They definitely deserve to be on a all defensive team. And Jaron, if not defensive player of the year, but they, they definitely deserve to be an all defensive team. Yeah, for sure. I mean, every, you look back at that Lakers team you won, Danny, like obviously it was AD and LeBron, but 
mm-hmm. that was also AD and LeBron defensively, especially with JaVel, Dwight at the rim, you, Avery, Avery Bradley, Bradley, KCP. KCP. That you know, was we have... for sure. Yeah. yeah. Raptors as Raptors as well. Uh, but with that being said, Ja, I'm gonna put you in a tough spot. You probably won't answer it, which I won't blame you. You only got <laughs> one vote, my friend. Who's winning defensive player of the year? You could only pick from your team. You could only got one vote. <laughs> Jared. Yeah. Yeah. Right. The stat the stats are the stats are mind blowing. As quick as I answered, I don't feel like it's that easy, but uh yeah. I'll give it to Jaron, man. You know, just you know what he's been doing for us. Uh, you know, on that end of the floor has been amazing. Um, obviously, you know, DB, it starts with him, you know, pretty much guarding, you know, the best guard on the floor. Um, even, you know, guarding some other matchups, you know, where he was guarding Zion. Um, but, you know, Jaron being able to, you know, protect the rim and also, you know, getting steals. Um, and then, you know, what he does on the other end of the floor, you know, offensively. Uh, I still, I, yeah, I got to go with Jaron, man. I'm a little biased, man, because DB is a guard. He plays my position, so I, I, I'm always going for the guards. But it is uh, absolutely amazing the difference in numbers defensively, how the team has gone from when Jaron was out from the first month to now and how mm-hmm. big of an impact he's had with protecting the rim and rebounding on that end floor. It was hard for us to protect the rim and also rebound as much when he was out. Um, but I said I, I, I'm going to have to give – a little right now, edge to Dylan until Jaron proves to me he can lock himself in a little bit more and stay out of foul trouble. Uh, I have uh, Dylan uh, in the lead just a little bit by a very small amount. Um, Ain't mad at that. We have two l- last questions, 12, before you get let you out of here. Um, one has been turning to some of the things, obviously, you, night and night, you're breaking records, man. You become franchise leader in triple doubles, you became franchise leader in this and breaking that. And um, the other night, you were. Only a second player in Memphis Grizzlies history to start an All Star game in 2022, 2023. Now, uh, well, in 2022, you were. Um, where does that rank in terms of some of the things that you've been able to accomplish this early in your career? Um, when it comes to, you know, the certain accolades and certain records that you have bro- broken, what is it? What is it? How does it feel to be, you know, one of the only guys in the history of the organization to start an All Star game? Um, just speaking on where it ranks, um, that's definitely, you know, top three on my list, um, for sure. Um, I feel like, you know, now just having that Christmas, um, you know, getting that Christmas game, um, I feel like that's definitely another, you know, moment, you know, that's up there for me, but, um, being able to start being the only player to start, you know, in franchise history with, you know, um, the players that have been through here, uh, it's definitely, you know, something, you know, special. Um, so it's definitely, you know, top three on my list without. All right, Ja, you are uh, a good, a very good basketball player. Uh, obviously, good conversationalist, and I've enjoyed your time. Uh, but now I need you to be a salesman because mm. for the most part, thanks to my friend over here, my sneakers come free. <laughs> <laughs> sell me. Can can you sell me on the Ja ones? Make me take some money out of my pocket. Oh, it's easy, man. Very comfortable shoe, um, you know. That whole process, you know, starting, you know, once um, it pretty much came in the picture, you know, I'm trying to just, you know, find a shoe that, you know, is comfortable and you can wear, you know, on and off the court um, pretty much. Um, a lot went into it. You know, I'm a big family guy, so it's, you know, a lot of things, you know, my family, you know, helped with, um, inspired me, you know, on the add on to the shoe. Um, but yeah, man, definitely comfortable. And if you you want to be a hooper for a day, um, I don't know what you do you know, outside. <laughs> Uh, he used to hoop way back in the day, not anymore. And towards Achilles a couple of years ago, he ain't hooping no more. I don't think insurance covers all of that, but he's not. He used to, he used to hoop way back in high school, but not anymore. Um, I did have one last question before we go. I said I'm a Puma guy, but I did like the commercial. Show. It was fire having Kari. It was dope, man. And as a dad, there's nothing more special than that. Having your young one. Uh, I'm not a dad yet, but I can imagine being a dad, having sure. a young one present you with something you never thought you'd be able to have. Um, my last question is is about more about life and, and instead of basketball, and it has to do with you you and your mom having this plan after you retire to become a billionaire. Speak on that, where it comes from, what it means to you, and you know, I guess your your route of what she has you on to to getting and achieving that goal because I think that's more important. It's building generational wealth and bringing it back to you know not just do your community as well. And obviously, I know you do a lot of community work. You do a lot with the youth and grassroots basketball. Talk to us about that and where that stems from with your mom and becoming a billionaire. 
Um, it's definitely, you know, um, you know, my mom and helping me, you know, big time, you know, with you know stuff like that off the court. Um, obviously, you know, keeping me focused, um, you know, keeping me locked in and, you know, always, you know, trying to protect my image and, you know, pretty much keep preaching, you know, the most important things, you know, obviously, you know, as an NBA player, um, you have life off the court, uh, whether, you know, a lot of people don't know how that goes, you know, a lot of ups and downs, you know, a lot of mental stuff, but, you know, my mom pretty much been keeping me locked. Um, she always, you know, been telling me, you know, since I got here, you know, to be a billionaire by 30. So, um, you know, with anything, you know, pretty much like that, um, obviously she helps me with, obviously, you know, I travel a lot, a lot on my plate, you know, practices, games, et cetera. But, you know, we have the time, you know, we actually talk about it and, um, I feel like, you know, that's that's what been, you know, keeping me going and motivated to, you know, keep going and, you know, continuing to get better, but also, you know, focus on, you know, that off the court. That's great, man. That's a that's a hell of a goal, man. I think that's the more important one is I said building building that for your community, building that for your family to where your your bloodline, they they understand what generational wealth is. And, yeah. you know, obviously you never know long long line who may come in a little wild and rebellious, but you know, my my goal as well is to. And I'm a little farther away from you, but become a billionaire and make sure the greens, from yep. here on out, you know, live a pretty good, comfortable life. And, and the Sanford you know, an side. And the Sanford. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> that's, a, that's his last name. If you didn't know, the black black Thank motherfucker you. over there. But yeah. Um. So yeah, that's a, that's a hell of a goal, man. That's more important. That's bigger than basketball. And said bringing back, giving back to the community. So. Um, we're gonna let you go on that one, man. We appreciate your time, bro. Big love, man. Thank you for making the time. Whenever you guys you need us for anything, if anything you got coming up outside the job ones that you want to promote or tell the fans about, you know, if you're ever in a studio or anything like that, or if you're doing something <laughs> else, we can plug that too. So, you know, let us know, man. But we appreciate your time, brother, and uh enjoy your, your rest of your day off. We got a, a nice little road trip coming up, and hopefully I'll be on on the wing with you soon, brother. Sir, appreciate you, my dog. Thanks, yep. Sir, yep. appreciate you, 12.